Our next presenter is Jason Knobloch. Mr. Knobloch has been in the water industry since 2003, in which time he's obtained multiple water and wastewater licenses and has served as general manager of different rural utilities. He holds a bachelor's degree in management and an associate degree in information technology. Jason currently serves as the deputy executive director at the Texas Rural Water Association, where he continues his passion to help utilities across the state. Please welcome Jason Nublock. So I was asked to come in and speak on asset management today. Uh, it's one of these buzzwords as of today uh, from federal, state, even local levels, trying to get a handle on what we have and what we're supposed to do with what we have. Um, there are different ways to look at it. There are various uh, templates out there, which I have uh, little uh, snippets of different sections from the uh, TCQ RG501 for small systems asset management, uh, the RG530 for the wastewater, EPA has one or two templates, uh, Environmental Finance Center has uh, an entire book on it, uh, AWWA, I think everyone has a version of this. And the, uh, the idea behind it, I mean, the basics of it anyhow, uh, is just asset management in a nutshell. If you're trying to observe what you have and get the longevity out of the assets and the investments that you had, uh, the most efficient and effective and cost-effective cost manner to make it last. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build capacity and resiliency in our utilities. Uh, in that process, we are also trying to improve our operations. Uh, we're utilizing and creating something that our operators and management that are out there every day that they can utilize to improve and make use or best of the system and what we have. Um, with all of that, you have to do some calculation. You got to get into the numbers game. You got to figure out what this need is on the financial aspect, uh, what it is today, and that is with O&M, with staff, with just day-to-day -day usage, even down to electrical usage. Uh, but what will it be in the future? I'm sure most of us are already seeing the growth. Um, I think the new number is 1,200 a day, or uh, even that gross, so I don't know. Um, but we're seeing a lot of growth in a lot of the rural areas that really haven't expected that. So projections of seeing what you're supposed to be, um, how you're supposed to better manage your assets. And then uh, encourage that knowledge sharing, making sure that not only your staff, your board, but also your stakeholders, your customers, the agencies, TCEQ or the funding agencies, know what your plan is. Know where you're at that you've addressed or at least acknowledged that you may have some shortcomings. And then what are you doing with it moving forward? So uh, being transparent is a big deal. And then of course, having a plan in place creates better opportunities for financial, opportun or financial advancement in some speed, uh, some manner to another. Uh, I know for a fact, like for the Water Development Board, having certain plans in place, like a capital improvement plan, a budget, asset management plan, provides extra points on the scale whenever they're doing their, uh, the IUP. So the idea is to know that you've already put the investment and time into this, to, to plan out what you're going to do with your utility shows a lot of good faith that you're doing it the right way. So asset management in a generalized process, and you have to forgive, this is 45 minutes. Uh, there are full day sessions and full classes on this, so I'm only hitting highlights, and I've already deleted a lot more slides that I mentioned already. So we're going to be kind of running through just some of the high points. But uh, determining your level of service, what are you offering your utility members or customers? Uh, taking an inventory, which is very inclusive of a lot of different details. Prioritizing those based on the critical levels or what is to fall apart first, in some cases. Uh, developing a plan for that and actually putting that plan into place, implementation. Uh, that is one thing I've seen since being at TRWA and honestly as a manager, I will have to say and admit that I've done it myself, but with a capital improvement plan or a preventative maintenance plan, source water protection plan, a lot of times we go through the effort up front and then it sits in a binder on a shelf. There's no implementation. So that is a big part of this. And then of course, reviewing and updating as necessary. So starting with level of service. This is probably a popular picture that most of us have seen. I've used it a lot. I hope that one day that I can meet the top end of this fella, but I always see this side. But uh, the level of service really defines the way we look at our utility, the way our stakeholders look at the utility. What are we providing for them? But it comes in different ways. Uh, public perspective. Seeing this, someone may see a liability versus a level of service, but 
Uh, obviously, there's some dedication here, but the public perspective of how are you running the system that they've, you know, they've elected the board or the council to manage the operations or the uh, general manager to do these functions. Um, if you're on a WSC, you're a member of this utility. How is this being carried out? How's it being taken care of? So with public perspectives means a lot. Um, if every Friday there's a fire hydrant flushing what seems to be mud out of uh, the fire, uh, fire hydrant on Main Street, there are questions, there are concerns. You know, do our bills pay for that to be looking like that? If you've been in public service long enough, I'm sure you've had the comment, uh, I pay your paycheck. So this is the public perspective. There's also whatever you're putting in your service agreements and policies. What are you saying to the customers that you're going to provide? And then lastly, we do have a level of service that we're expected by rules and regulations down from federal, state, and even local levels. Uh, just example, if you think about it, pressure requirements, right? There's a minimum. Uh, chlorine residuals, there's a minimum. We have a level of service that we're expected to provide. So whenever you're thinking about asset management, a level of service and talking about all, all this may not make a lot of sense and how that really relates, but this really is the driver of making sure what we're doing and the rest of it and how we're doing it. Uh, why is it important to manage and make sure that maintenance is being done on pumps and tanks uh, that staff are being taken care of? It's to make sure that our level of service is continuing like it's supposed to. So as an asset, uh, I don't know how clear this picture is, but when someone looks at, at what an asset is, the, it has a various perspective. So as a utility uh, operator, which I once was, I would see this picture, and I would see an asset to me is the chop saw that I'm holding, the shovel in the ground, that piece of equipment behind me. Those are assets because they help me do my job. If you look at this from a, an accountant perspective, the money people in the room, an asset's different. An asset may be based on a level of cost or expense. It could be uh, anything over $500 of an expense or $5,000. Uh, so you look at it differently. But on a management level of this, you not only see all of those things, but you see the person in the hole as an asset. Uh, the, the pipe going in the ground, that's building capacity. Um, the easement that they're actually working in is an asset. So you look at these things different, but to know that all assets refer to uh, any physical objects as well as intangible items such as capital, uh, money, or uh, staff. So you have to look at this and think of how in-depth you want to get or how simplistic you want to be with an asset management plan. But just know the more in-depth you get, the more robust you can be about this and the more actually the, the results come from that. I took this from the EPA um, template model and it's supposed to give you kind of a picture of where to start when you're talking about the assets in the field, all the way from the drinking water source, all the way up to the house that your customers are receiving this water to. Uh, it's not all inclusive. There are things in here like fences around your buildings. Um, there's not equipment, there's not trucks. Uh, there's things that are definitely missing out of this, but it provides a good idea of saying that you're going from the drinking water source to the tap, and that's what we're looking for. We wanna see what all are we actually responsible for maintaining. So in the information that you collect when you're doing the assets, it's the details, the very specifics of it. You have to do an assessment to see what shape it's in, uh, the design life for this thing, and then if you have any service history, any kind of records that you could apply to this to see if it's actually gonna last as long as it's supposed to. I do have a little caveat in here that says that, uh, understand that the information that you're putting together, especially if you get as in depth as you should, uh, this is a lot of information that could be used to, to harm a utility. You're not only finding all the, the absolute details of every part of your system, but even the location of it and how it operates and how it works. So just keep that in mind. Once you build this thing, it's not something you necessarily want to post on your website because there's a lot of information in there. So just breaking that down a little bit. Asset details. It, it seems like if you were to go out in GIS or GPS uh, and put together some kind of digital mapping uh, of your utility, you may collect a point for a valve or a meter. And that seems like that should be enough because you know you have a valve and a meter. But the details is where this asset management comes in. Is the manufacturer, what kind of model it is, um, the depth, when was it installed is a very key component of it. If you have any kind of records, uh, maps, anything that can give you an indication of when this was put in the ground, this impacts the design life and when you should plan to replace it. Um, the absolute location, 
GPS. I come from a very rural area, and I have been guilty of saying it's over there by where that house used to be, or uh, by that tree, or that truck, or we have a turnover in workforce right now that I hope continues because we need some people, but uh, they don't know where the house used to be. So GPS is something that doesn't move. Accuracy is key. So uh, there's other presentations on that today. I encourage you to, to join those. But uh, knowing exactly where all these things are. And then, of course, putting a cost to it. What did it cost you to put it in? Which is going to be vastly different of what it's going to cost for you to replace it these days. Uh, we all know that. Um, whenever you're putting this stuff together, you do have to consider inflation, uh, the cost of um, contractors and things like that, but you get an idea of these speci the specifics on this particular item. And the same for wells or anything else. And the reason I say that the details really matter is it, take wells, for example. If you know that you have a 25 horse submersible pump, um, that is gonna need to be replaced. It, we're working on 20 years, something is going to happen, so let's be proactive. You know the size, model, depth, you know all of this. You can price this out, go through vendors, uh, and plan this out in a projection to know what you should be budgeting for and what it's going to cost you when you're ready for it. So the details matter. There are various tools, as I mentioned. Uh, TCQ has their RG501 that comes with uh, worksheets where you can put all of this stuff in there. Uh, and while I'm noticing Jason in the back, I'm going to go ahead and say this now, but there are some uh, manuals that he has downstairs, right? Okay. Uh, with this. So if y'all want to see uh, the hard copy of those uh, RG documents, it's the uh, Asset Management for Small Systems. Um, they just, there's copies of that, but the digital version also, also supplies a, um, uh, an Excel worksheet where you enter in all this data, you plug in all the costs, design life, and all of this, and it gives you a projection of things. So uh, there are tools out there that are free. Uh, there are also other options such as the CMMS, uh, the Computerized Maintenance Management System. This is a very robust tool. Uh, it's a very expensive tool. I don't know if we have vendors in the room that sell this, so I don't mean to step on toes if so, but it, it is expensive. But it's very robust. It goes down to even sending out notifications, uh, calendar reminders, work orders about changing the oil in the trucks or uh, you know greasing the track hose. It, there's a lot of information that can dive into this kind of program. It's just you pay for it up front. Uh, but it is typically for the larger utilities. There's also options of using uh, GIS or digital maps. You're out there collecting all this information anyway. You just add the fields that you need to and then export that information to plug into templates like TCQ has. So there are other ways to do it. Uh, the range goes from free to 20,000. That's maybe a year. So uh, you kind of pick your poison on that. But there are tools to help you out there. While on site, you're doing condition assessments. So you're looking at the factors that are gonna impact the useful life of the asset. Um, I will also say again, and the good thing that I don't remember all the utility names, so I can't say them anyway, but you know, even on my own systems, we've had lines that we've put in, and in a year and a half, because we have not exercised the valve itself, it is completely full of mud. How that happens, I'm not really sure, I'm not the geologist to figure that out, but, uh, it's very apparent when you come back to that to see, is it operate, uh, will it operate? Obviously not, not in its current condition. Is it accessible? Absolutely not. Uh, is it being very efficient or effective? Right now, it's just another piece of the water line because there's nothing you can do with that valve. So it just kind of drives the idea of preventative maintenance. Everything has some kind of schedule to say that what you should be doing with your assets. On a valve, it should be an exercise program to some extent on some kind of schedule. So looking at the condition assessments, there is a common practice to put a category on this. And it can be anywhere from poor to excellent, one to five. Uh, the different templates give different versions of this. But whenever you're building up your assets from 100 assets to thousands of assets, it, you have some way to filter out what's going to be more critical for you to uh, focus on whenever you're building this. And believe it or not, even if you have utilities that here, homeowner associations, IOUs, you may not realize exactly how many assets you have. You start listing them out. Um, it, it can be pretty shocking. So these, way, uh, these category, uh, categories or condition ratings, rather, give you a way to kind of filter out what is necessary to prioritize your efforts on. 
Uh, looking back at any kind of operations and maintenance, service history, everything should, again, have some kind of schedule of maintenance. Um, reviewing records, if you have vehicles or if you have, to say, pumps um, that may have some kind of service that should be done biannually, uh, every six months, whatever the case may be, uh, is it being done? Because that is going to impact the design life uh, in a detrimental way, but it will impact it. So looking at records, um, even down to your buildings, your pump houses, every so often you have to replace the shingles, you have to put paint on it. It's another asset that you have to take care of. Uh, I have an example here. This is one, just a worksheet that we put together for our generators. So whenever we're called out to emergencies, we give this to the system that's using it. And it's just set by an hour milestone. So every 10 hours, I need you to do this. Every 200 hours, do this. It needs to have a maintenance schedule because you're properly uh, managing that asset. This is an example I pulled from one of our associate members uh, just to kind of push the point of maintenance versus replacement or waiting to the end, rather. Uh, this is an example of a, a tank. And they broke this down to saying that if you expense a little bit each year over the next 15 years versus just waiting and doing bare minimal and waiting until 15 years where you're going to have to do a major rehab, uh, there's over $100,000 worth of savings in that. So this kind of builds to the idea of asset management. Once you've identified what you have and you start to build this up and develop that plan, develop that uh, implementation of how you're going to put this into practice, this is where it comes in. You know the cost, you know what you have to budget for, you know what you have to plan out, and the savings can be uh, significant, especially for small utilities. So useful life. This is, uh, I want to say, one of the last components of, say, collecting the assets in the field, and it's how long will it last? Most of the uh, templates that I mentioned do have some type of chart in there to give you an indication of typical design life. I believe this one is from the TCQ version, but um, again, it's not set in stone after this amount of dates or years, uh, chunk it. It's not what it's saying. It's just something as a planning tool. And we all know there's one category here, uh, transmission lines, pipelines. It says 35 years. How many people in this room have beat that by a lot? There should be a lot of hands because I know the difference. Um, there are lines still in place from the 60s, the 50s, that have never been touched or rehabbed or replaced. So this is, again, a guideline. Now, this guideline is to say that it's to be used at its optimal performance. A transmission line may last you about 35 years. Uh, if you go 60, you know you've been putting repair clamps and fixing holes and leaks ever since then, right? So this is all dependent uh, on various... Um, Factors as well, your operations and maintenance. Are you doing the maintenance you're supposed to be doing on all of these assets? You just did a, uh, a condition assessment while you're collecting this information. What does that look like? Um, is it still in good shape? Is it in poor shape? Is it excellent? Uh, those factors weigh heavily on the useful life of what's left on it. But there's other parts of it. Uh, the water quality. We unfortunately have utilities out there that may not pump the best kind of water out of the ground. Maybe it's hot water, high in minerals, uh, it has a lot of buildup in certain, you know, valves and uh, structures in your utility. Um, maybe it's very corrosive. So there, there's different uh, aspects to it to consider whenever you're saying this should last 20 years, but it may not because of this. Uh, also, the different parts of the state we're in. And then, of course, my favorite is correct installation. Um, I come, before I came to TRWA, I came from a system that is in Central Texas. And if you can imagine or from the area, you know it's full of rock. And the way or the process to put in a line in that particular area is to get a rock saw, cut it, drop the pipe on that bedded rock, and then fill it with all the chunks of sharp rock that you just pulled out of it. Uh, that's the process. Instead of looking at bedding or the, the, the guidance that AWWA has put out there for us to do this correctly, there was other thoughts in mind. So uh, in that case, a pipeline will absolutely not last 35 years, and I can attest to that. Uh, and if you've never fixed anything that's been buried like that or installed like that, it's pretty interesting because uh, you can dig away everything around that pipe, and there may be one pebble under it that has the leak, but as soon as you move that pebble, everything explodes. Um, so it's pretty neat, I will say that. There's some good experiences there. Watching operators float out of a hole is really cool. Um, 
especially when they scramble and they can't because it's slippery and they, you can just see them. It's, it's fun. But um, so you've collected all the assets, you've collected all the components, what you need to identify every part of it. Now you go to prioritizing them. So you have to first go with what's critical. What makes uh, everything tick? What makes the water flow? And on our basic considerations, we know it's our water sources, which is the hottest commodity for us right now. Um, trying to obtain a water source or increase your water sources is extremely difficult at this moment. So that is a critical asset. You want to protect that. Uh, the pumps to get the water where it's supposed to be going, to get it to the people, uh, your customers. And then, of course, the tanks holding this hot commodity. Um, and also, in, in the case that you have elevated storage, this supplies your pressure. So these are critical assets. If they go down, then there may be some issues with that. So put these in a, um, a categorization to say what's critical. If they are in uh, a state of condition assessment to where it's not all that great, you definitely want to put these higher up in the ranking. And then you also consider the likelihood of failure and consequence of failure. So the, uh, it's, it's not only if your asset is in good shape or not, it's the fact of what is, what's gonna happen if it goes out. Uh, do you have redundancy for that? And this is where I started pulling out a lot of slides. So I'm trying to now track to see how much time I've been going because I may have pulled out too many slides. So I'm gonna start talking slower now. <laughs> so likelihood and uh, consequence of failure. So instead of likelihood, probability. Uh, versus consequence. I don't know if you can see this, I, was, I typically try to do things in themes, and it was going to be a Jeep theme, and I was going to you know, marry the asset management to taking care of a Jeep, and it just didn't work out. But I did leave some of the pictures in here, and I don't know if you can see, but it's a strut or spring held together by duct tape and uh, vice grips. So the probability and consequence. There are different methods to look at this. One is a high probability but low consequence. There's a good chance this is going to break. But... The consequence of it and the fact that they were willing to do that means there's probably not a lot of consequence to that. Um, if you look at this in your system, though, there may be something, say, a, a meter. If it goes out, your loss is not accurately collecting water for that month until you notice it, right? So it may not seem like it's a high consequence. But there's a good probability because if you look at it, it's been there for 40, 50 years. Uh, you apply this kind of concept, and it's called run-to-failure method. So you're, with this, you have to consider what is the cost, the staff time, the investment uh, to go in and do the O&M or replacement. Do we want to do all that right now ahead of time with the possibility of extending the life? Or do you want it to actually go out and just replace it when it's time? I'm not going to say I prefer one or the other, but there are considerations on return on investment that you do put into play in some of this. Uh, same with low probability but high consequence. There's a low probability that you have a brand new well that's gonna go out next year. But if it does, bad news, right? So things that have more of a higher consequence, you definitely wanna to elevate to the top of the chain to at least have more, more proactive maintenance, more checks, maybe quarterly versus annually, um, things like that. And this should help you structure what an asset management plan you use or the template you put together. Um, also, in, with all of this, the probability versus consequence, again, you want to consider the asset and the O&M cost, how that plays out, compare the two, but uh, in other areas such as efficiency. Uh, we have one program, Mr. Perkins runs that for us, is energy efficiency. And looking at some of the stuff that you have, uh, it's been pretty impressive, the reports that he comes back with, to say that if you were to just change this or do this instead, the amount of savings you have. So if you get to a place to where your pump or motor is running and it's been doing the same thing for 20, 30 years, if you just look at what the return on investment is for that, it may absolutely be worth changing it out now to recoup some of the savings then. Uh, and then lastly, the public view on level of service. The probability and consequence, even if it's a low consequence, the fact that someone has to see you out in the field digging up the same pipe all the time um, probably isn't the best perspective from the public side of it, right? Why are we always having leaks? Why is this mud always flushing out of the fire hydrants? Um, why is the water always down for just a little bit? Uh, I see all these public notices. I don't know why we keep getting asked about public notices and boulevard notices so much lately, but we do. Um, it's that public perspective. So maybe the consequence doesn't seem so much, but it is to someone else. So things to consider. Another Jeep thing. I thought it was pretty cool. 
So proactive maintenance, pros and cons, uh, planned versus unplanned. Again, I keep doing this ROI thing like I am in money management or something, and I'm absolutely not. But it's the, it's the buzzword I'm going to use for parts of this. So there is actually absolutely uh, some positive things for proactive management. That's, what's, that's the goal. That's what we should be doing. We shouldn't wait till something breaks to fix it. Um, and, and that's kind of where we, it feels like we've been in a lot of areas uh, through our utilities for a long time, and we're trying to put the focus back into that proactive. But when you look at certain things, you may have to put question or more thought into it. So there's two different pictures. I didn't really separate them well. And luckily, I don't know who these are from. So if it's your utility, you're safe. Um, so this particular one on the left, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a flush valve that this utility found. It has grown into a tree, so it's obviously not being used. Uh, it could be at the dead end main. There is absolutely a need to do this. We need to fix this quick, and they probably already have. Um, this could be also an inline flush valve. If you look at the material that it's made of, it, the line, the whole line may be galvanized. Is it worth taking the time to fix this or do some research to see how big of a stretch that is of galvanized and replace the whole thing? You kind of weigh your options of how much investment you're gonna put into this versus doing the rest of it the right way. Uh, same scenario on the right. You've seen exposed line. There's a problem there. I mean, it's accessible to the public. So make could go over there and a kid throw a rock at it just because he wants to be a jerk, and then now you have to fix it at night. So, uh, but if you think about it, it does need to be fixed, but what's the likelihood of this actually being a lot more shallow, you know, shallower, I guess, uh, even further? This is just the part that it's exposed. It may be that it just floated once it was installed and sand got under it and pushed this one section up, but the likelihood is that it goes much further than this. So do you want to take the time and investment of fixing 20 to 30 feet of pipe? Or do you want to look at planning this out to say this may be about a two, two, 300 foot stretch that we need to address? So it's the plan versus unplanned. Um, looking at this, driving up on this pipe, I would think most of us would want to go ahead and address it today because you can't have that. Uh, but planning it out uh, may reward, ha have higher rewards uh, when, you, when you kind of go through the return on investment. So you've built everything, you've uh, collected this data, you put it into a worksheet, you have everything you need for it, and then now you have to apply a cost. And I do suggest going to engineers, uh, asking people that have been doing this, calling your neighboring systems. Find out what is the cost. What have they been paying per foot to do line or to do a tank rehab or you know, something similar to what you're looking at. Um, get some information and uh, build what the cost would be. And the components of this is, of course, the initial cost of uh, insulation. It's the O&M expenses. And I may mention this again on another slide, but people are not uh, considering the O&M as much as they should be, uh, especially with newer treatments. Uh, there's, there's new, bigger and better ways to treat the water to get uh, a better product out of it, but they're not considering the, the monthly or quarterly or biannually uh, O&M cost for this. Filtration or getting rid of waste or whatever the case may be. Um, it's something that you definitely have to consider as a cost factor. Repair cost, what is it going to be to, to change it out or rehabilitate it? And then disposal. So if you're treating for arsenic or something like that, there is a fee for an environmental to get rid of that once you're done with it. Um, are you considering that in this treatment if you're, uh, or any of these costs? So, and I put a, a note in here, which is supposed to have followed up with another slide that I did delete. But uh, to say, don't put these in aggregate costs, but individual. And what I mean by that is if you're going to your board and you put in a budget that we spent $70,000 on field maintenance or repairs, that doesn't really tell you a lot. Does that, is that the tank? Is that lines? Is that backflow devices? Um, break it out. You spent 60,000 in line repairs, another 10 in all of these other categories. Or maybe it was even across the board. But it tells you, it tells you a lot on what you're supposed to focus on. Uh, if most of your expenses is in tanks, maybe you need to get a little bit better preventative maintenance plan on tanks. So uh, just when you're looking at the cost, consider those things. Okay. Uh, create a plan. Obviously, uh, these are all kind of individual items, but also it builds into an asset management, uh, capital improvement plan. Parts of this are definitely developed from the assets that you've collected and you said these are priorities, these are needs. Uh, building your budget, looking at your rates. It's a big deal, and if we have board members in here, I know that's one of those things that most people start doing this, but rates are a big deal. 
Um, this is how we are driving what we can do to be proactive and do this asset management. Uh, evaluate the logistics of it, trying to figure out when you're supposed to plan this out. You can say I need to do it and you want to do it tomorrow, but that's just not gonna happen. Um, and then of course, update as needed. On your budget, if you've not set one, if you've not done one, um, this is a process of reviewing what your expenses have been, taking out all the anomalies, all these uh, random factors. Maybe you've had some legal issues. Uh, maybe you had a pump go out. There's a big hit of 30 or 40,000. You take those things out and consider of a good budget and then start adding in all the projects and things that you just put together. Uh, consider the growth of a system. Growth is good, it is, but it also comes with a lot of expenses. So it comes with revenues, but some heartaches as well. So consider both. Once you start getting more people, revenues may be coming in, but you may need more staff, you may need more vehicles, more equipment, things of this nature. Um, be sure to include depreciation. For the first couple years of my work in this business, I was always told it's a paper number. It's actual a number is for you putting money back to replace that thing. Uh, so take a better look at that. And then of course include inflation. I believe the number, uh, Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics said that since 2020, we've had about 17.5% inflation costs over these last few years. I don't know that this trajectory is gonna be the same. Uh, it may go down, it may go up, but whenever you're planning these things out, put some kind of fluff in there to at least address some of that. And then how will you fund it? So we're gonna go, I'm not going into this a lot. I think there's other uh, topics on funding and I know the other agencies are out here. So I encourage you to please go talk to USDA or Water Development Board or any of the others that may have some, uh, some funding options, but consider how you're gonna pay for this. I mean, are we, uh, do you have the reserves? Have you been funding depreciation? Do you have lines of credit, short-term, long-term? When we say long-term, we're talking about these 30 or 40 year notes. Understand that if you've never went through a process of that, that it takes time. So if you think you need to get something done in the next few years, start today. Uh, it's not something that you run out there and you have money in the bank by the end of the week. So consider that. And then make sure your rate structure is sustainable to implement all of this and pay back any loans that, you know, that came with uh, limited grants or things like that. So when you're setting your rates, be conservative on the revenues and be more liberal on the expenses. Everything is going up. I, just, I don't think it's really necessary to say that, but we know that. Um, we get the comments a lot. I want to call my neighboring system to see what they charge. Please understand that every utility has different uh, factors that really drive that. They may have two new wells that they just purchased, so their rates may be higher because of that. Uh, they may be having water quality issues. They could have fines. They could have other things going on. Do not base rates on your neighboring system. Get a rate study. Uh, hire one out. Contact one of the association groups that can assist with that. Find someone that will come in here and help and make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to for your system and not someone else's. So whenever you do rates, um, make sure that you are looking at uh, the customers. The higher impact users should be paying the higher amounts. Uh, and then also make these things easy to understand. You wanna implement them often, but small, so they're not big hits on those that are having a hard time, but uh, it needs to be easy to understand. We've seen three levels of tiers and rates, and I've seen 15 or 20 levels of tiers, and I, there's no way that I could follow that. Um, so unless you want someone answering the calls to explain those things all the time, consider making them understandable or uh, simplistic uh, to some degree. And then we've had someone uh, actually talk to me during the break about this particular component of it, the asset management and community involvement, making sure that whatever your efforts are out there, that you're being transparent about it. Whenever you just apply a new rate, you raise the rates. And if you're not being transparent and let people know why you're doing it, you're gonna get a lot of flack, even to an extent that you may not appreciate because it may go above your system. It may go to state levels. It may go to uh, representatives that will now start calling around and figuring out what you're doing. Make the time, set the meetings, do community meetings, uh, set things up at churches. Let them know when I said about being uh, asset management being something that you're knowledge sharing. Develop this and give highlights and summaries of what we have found. We have found that we have 75% of our system that is over 40 or 50 years old. We need to start doing this and these are our priorities. This is what it's gonna cost us. Let people give you some input. Let them understand it though. Um, it's, it's way, way better to be upfront about it uh, and, and let people know what's happening before it happens. 
get their support, uh, share some of the information like I mentioned, and then be sure that they also have an opportunity to tell you what they see out there. Uh, I know as a manager, it wasn't always our utility operators that gave us the most intel. It was always the customers. They would call us to let us know, pressure's low. Uh, there's a nice stream of water going through my creek and it never does. Uh, so those kind of things, those are the eyes and ears out there. Give them an opportunity to let you know what they think is actually uh, hampering the system, what's causing that level of service to decline. So uh, set, those, set those meetings, have that community involvement. As a wrapping up, I did want to mention, uh, again, the, the resources that TCQ has. It's the 501 for the water system and 530. Uh, Jason does have some in the small business section or the booth down there. Uh, so please go see him about that. And then you can also find these online on TCQ's website. It's not really that difficult to navigate as I heard this morning. You can find it, use the search box. That's how I go on there every day, the search box. Uh, EPA does have a few different versions on here, which uh, do have links. I don't know if you have access to this digitally. I didn't get that information. But I put them on here for that reason, if you can get to them. Uh, look at other associations. There's a lot of information out there. A lot of different groups have put this together because they know the importance of it. And then again, to just for conversation's sake, please go by and visit with Mr. Jason Robinson on asset management. I know he does road shows on this particular topic often. Um, I hate that I couldn't go into all the other details that I did leave out because I know there is more to it. But uh, I do appreciate the time and thank you for listening. Uh, I guess if we do any questions or... We've got a couple minutes. Okay. If there's any question, question, uh, actually a couple of questions from people online. The first one is: Will PUC accept an AMP to use in rate development? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to speak for PUC. Um, I will say that for PUC's purposes, they they want documentation to show that you know you are putting the effort into uh, justifying what you're doing. Uh, if you have to do a rate adjustment or something like that, but I don't. I don't. I'm not comfortable speaking on their behalf of what they will accept or not. Okay. I have one other question from someone online. Regarding rates, I thought I'd re read something a while back that said utilities can increase yearly via a cost of living increase without going through a year's worth of paperwork for a rate increase. Is that true or false? It's really going to depend um, heavily on the type of system that they are. It sounds like it's going to be an investor-owned utility based on how the question is asked. And there are uh, caveats to that. Uh, there is an option for that to be the case. But without knowing more about the utility, um, I, I would say reach out to uh, uh, DUO, is the utility outreach group at PUC. Um, I know Tammy and Celia Eves, they can, they can assist with that just to kind of guide them in the right direction. But again, without knowing more about the utility type, I, again, don't want to answer that. Is that it? Okay. Any other questions in person? Sweet. All right. Thank you very much.